Hi, everybody. Welcome back. If you're just, uh, if you've been with us today, this is Innovation Day at the IBM Community Festival. If you're just joining us, welcome. We're so pleased to have you. Um, I'm Angie Borman, and I'm one of your hosts for today. And we have such an exciting treat for you uh, to start uh, the afternoon here on the um, in the U.S. In the, um, in the U.S. And we're so delighted to have Tanme Bakshi. Uh, with us and Michael Francis. These two are innovation rock stars and um, very well-known public speakers, uh, difference makers in the world. Guys, we're so, so delighted to have you. Both have been working in and around IBM for a number of years. Um, when you see them, you won't believe it, but um, they're joining us uh, as just superstars and part of new innovative thinking in today's IBM. And guys, we're so uh, happy to have you today. Um, looking forward to having you share your thoughts. And we'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Angie. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, really excited to get to speak with you today and talk about uh, IBM and, and, and all the sorts of innovation that, uh, that that we're working on. I mean, I know that's definitely a buzzword, something you've heard a lot about. <laughs> you've, heard a word, a lot, you've heard that word a lot, I'm sure. Uh, but we're going to be diving deep into what exactly it is that we're doing um, that, really, that really deserves that word, I think. Um, now, to start off with a really quick introduction, you know, who am I and why am I here today? Well, it's because really I love technology, right? I love building technology, applying it in domains where I think it can have an impact. Um, and also then taking that technology and enabling more people to use it so that they can innovate by actually solving problems with that technology, right? I think that's definitely a key um, is it's all about being able to apply that technology where it can make an impact. And I'm being joined today by a good friend of mine, Michael Francis, I'm gonna let him introduce as well. Yes. Yeah, so hello, everyone. As Tammy mentioned, I'm Michael Francis. And the way I like to think of myself is I'm someone who turns everyday people into innovative thinkers, whether it's business or engineering. I focus on inspiring people to be curious about the world around them and challenge the conventional way of thinking. I pride myself in being a jack of all trades and really a master of none. And I'd like to pass it back off to Tanmay. Sounds good. Now, as I mentioned, I'm really passionate about technology. <laughs> of course, that is that is you know what I love. At, at heart, I am a developer. I love to write code. I love to work with tech. Um, I mean, you can you can probably tell by the fact that I work on all this sort of tech at IBM, right? And so that's why today I definitely want to focus a lot on the world of technology. But at the same time, what I also want to do today um, is we're going to dive into the world of business as well, as well, right? We're going to talk about you know, there's this sort of stereotype almost with the enterprise um, and how enterprises are difficult to work with. Uh, the technology that we build is annoying to use and, and, and isn't documented very well, or we might move slow from a business perspective. Right? That's the general enterprise stereotype with any large company, right? But what I want to do is help break down that stereotype and show you what we're actually doing uh, today in order to help you deliver more innovative solutions quicker than ever possible before. And I want to start off, of course, talking about this from a technology standpoint. And I think in order to do so, it would be really nice uh, to take a little bit of a trip to the past and talk about how I got started working with this uh, next generation technology myself. I mean, I started working with the world of AI and machine learning when I stumbled upon Watson playing Jeopardy. And I, I think it's hard to really state just how impressive this was as a technical accomplishment, right? Especially back in 2011, when Watson actually played and won Jeopardy against the two best human competitors. That was absolutely incredible. Like, even to this day, I think it's still one of the most impressive feats in machine learning, right? And the reason for that is just because it's so complex. Right? Jeopardy is all about natural language processing and understanding super complex clues with puns and riddles and wordplay that even humans have a hard time decoding. And here we have a computer system that takes three seconds to just 
answer Jeopardy clues with accuracy and, and speed better than that of humans, right? It's, it's honestly pretty incredible how we can do this. That fascinated, you know, 11 year old Tanmay uh, to the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence and how all of this works. And that's how I got into the world of using and, and sort of understanding the impact of machine learning technology. But here's the thing, machine learning is so impactful that we're using it in practically every domain at this point, right? Just like how technology is the infrastructure for every domain and, you know, rightfully it is its own domain, but really is the fundamental, you know, sort of inner working of practically every other domain as well. Similarly, machine learning has become infrastructure for other domains. But the problem is that machine learning itself also needs technology infrastructure. And infrastructure is really annoying to set up. A lot of the times it can be a distraction from whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish as an organization, right? The more time that you spend struggling with your infrastructure, the less time you have to actually solve problems and accomplish what it is that you want to build, right? Taking a look at, you know, maybe a classic workflow, right? In the, a couple of years ago, maybe you would have uh, an IBM Cloud bare metal server that you want to set up, right? These things give you, you know, literally bare metal speed, right? We've got people in the data centers actually putting these servers in the racks. You know, we're giving you bare metal speed, but there's a bit of a problem here, right? Let's just say you were to allocate a bare metal with some GPUs. A lot of the times you're writing and prototyping code alongside the fact that you're training them. So now you're paying for GPU time that you're not really using. At the same time, say you need a very specific version of TensorFlow. Now you've got to install that version. But then it turns out that, well, this requires a very specific version of CUDNN that was only compatible with the last version of Ubuntu because this new one has a kernel bug that stops TensorFlow's you know, text generation feature from working. There's all sorts of really weird niche edge case things that can trip you up. Right? Infrastructure is annoying to set up. So the less of it you need to focus on, the better. And that is where Watson comes in, right? I started my journey with Watson. Uh, as a matter of fact, I started my journey at IBM uh, working on developer content around the IBM Watson tooling on IBM Cloud. For example, with Watson Studio, right, you have the capability to be able to set up entire environments for machine learning, like a little, you know, Jupyter Lab even, uh, where you can write custom code using open source packages uh, to train machine learning models without needing to set up any of this infrastructure yourself. You say, I want this version of Python, these versions of these packages, and I want these many GPUs, and suddenly you're paying only for the time that you use and you've got everything set up for you, right? These sorts of quality of life improvements make it so that you have the bandwidth with which to innovate. Um, and then from there, of course, the big thing is, can you even use that technology, right? If we were to provide you with Watson Studio, do you know how to use it? Do you know where to go to achieve certain things? And that is why I've worked on, for example, code patterns that are fully you know, publicly available, open source, um, essentially repositories of code that you can go clone, integrate into your own applications, and even just use to learn how individual IBM services work. This, for example, was my very first code pattern demonstrating how you can train movie recommender systems using open source packages on Watson Studio. It really is fun seeing uh, how it's, it's, it's so accessible, you know, this, this world of machine learning, thanks to these sorts of services that we've built out. As a matter of fact, more recently, I've been working on the DB2 team and similarly trying to take enterprise grade database capabilities and make it not only easier to use, but in my opinion, the easiest to use database in the world, right? Well, you'll, you'll be hearing more about that soon. There's some things that we can't talk about just yet. You'll be hearing more about what it is that we're doing to do so soon. Um, but this, for example, is an example flow of an application that we built using uh, DB2 services, enabling you to explore through a database of movies, search through them, get recommendations, and even have a visual graph interface to this data. And what's really fun is that these examples aren't contrived, right? We're not sitting here thinking, hmm, how can we build an application that specifically uses these DB2 services, right? We want to build an app and we use this natural flow that makes sense. And I think that's what really relates to developers and improving developer experience, right? I mean, it quite literally doesn't get simpler than this, right? This is the simplest way to connect to a database and grab results from it. And this is using the wonderful DB2 REST service, enabling you to connect to DB2 through a REST interface. Um, and, and this is specifically using the language native Swift wrapper around DB2 REST uh, that I've built for super safe 
and super convenient code, even if you're running asynchronous queries that traditionally require a lot more infrastructure and a lot more code to build out manually. It really is exciting what you can do uh, with these new capabilities that we're building out. And it goes so much deeper than that, right? We're innovating on a technical front, and this really does enable you to deliver better applications and new capabilities, right? Traditionally, for example, if you had a database of financial transactions and you wanted to analyze this, this database of transactions in order to find patterns in, for example, crime or, or, or certain activities that, that users partake in, right? Traditionally, this would require you to take your relational database, copy it over into a graph database, run graph queries or somehow you've got to represent your graph queries as relational queries and that's unintuitive that requires a lot of extra engineering effort now with the power of db2 graph you don't need to do any of that right we can take your graph queries in industry standard languages like apache uh, tinkerpop and we can translate them to sql under the hood so you can run graph queries against db2 as a relational database Right? These sorts of capabilities aren't possible anywhere else. And thanks to this technical innovation that we deliver, we allow you to be able to innovate and build out better solutions from a technical perspective faster than ever possible before, but also easier than ever possible before. Right? We're making it so that these enterprise-grade capabilities don't come with the traditional you know, enterprise stereotype cost. Right? So that's what we're doing from a technical perspective. Right? We're doing a lot more than that, but that's, that's what we have time to cover today. So if you have any questions about that, you know, start putting that in the chat. We, we, we will get to it for sure. Uh, we'll have a good 10 minutes at the end to, to, to sort of cover your questions. Uh, but now I'm going to hand it off to Michael to talk a little bit more about what it is that we're doing from a business perspective as well, so we can work with you more easily too. Thank you very much, Tanmay. So as Tamme just mentioned, DB2 REST is an incredible new achievement. Now you can get up and running even faster and your code will be more debuggable, making problems easier to solve and allowing your developers to act faster than ever before. And DB2 Graph allows you to discover new trends in your data without the hassle of copying your data to or interacting with a graph database. And code patterns allow your developers to not only learn how to use DB2, but also take advantage of its groundbreaking features to help you deliver your best product yet. And finally, IBM Watson makes it easier than ever to de deliver cognitive capabilities to your applications by eliminating the need to manually manage the infrastructure to train machine learning models. And the best part is we're not done yet. As you know, integration is vital to surviving in the tech world today. More and more, users want to be connected to the digital world, and they want their digital devices to connect to each other. But it's not as easy as it sounds. In fact, I have a picture here of a product manager trying to enable more integration with their product. And this is exactly what it looks like. Absolute headache. So IBM recognized that innovation is modular. Sometimes it's not that you have the wrong pieces. You just need to orient them in the right way. That is why we need one central product that allows users to centralize their resources on the cloud. And that one product is IBM Cloud Pack for Data. IBM Cloud Pack for Data enables you to have a single, consistent, and easy to use interface on all of your cloud resources, no matter where they're hosted, on premise, on a third party cloud, behind a firewall, maybe even all three at once. And IBM Cloud Pack for Data is built, is built specifically for the modern enterprise that's climbing the AI ladder and centering development around data science. It provides an easy method to collect, organize, and analyze data with the traditional, even cutting edge techniques as well, such as auto AI from IBM Research. And all of this works at an enterprise scale. The best part is that we embrace open source technologies, allowing developers to use the most popular packages to help you achieve your goals. Now, this morning, Steve Astorino mentioned IBM Hyperblue, an internal program that's ultimately helping organizations reimagine their business models and deliver greater value to their customers by unleashing the entrepreneurial spirit of IBMers and delivering groundbreaking solutions in IBM startup businesses. By removing these businesses from the shackles of a large organization and giving them the freedom, agility, and speed of a startup, IBM Hyperblue is a new approach to innovation that will redefine the way we think about creating new products. So that's a little bit about Hyperblue. So why don't we tell you what's new with Hyperblue? You may have heard from earlier today some of the talks that we had, and I'll just go over them as well. 
we have IBM Pathway Signal Management with Watson. Here, we are leveraging the latest technologies within data and AI to help healthcare organizations improve and simplify the collection, organization, and visualization of their healthcare data. Using a clinical natural language processing engine that has been continuously developed over the past six years, combined with Watson machine learning capabilities, the goal is to help reduce unwarranted variation in the healthcare delivery system. And all of it is protected by an active cybersecurity service, which meets regulators' levels of approval. There's also Quick Scout, which allows HR and IT teams to improve employee experiences by developing a virtual agent that helps employees quickly answer questions and automate tasks. This has resulted in some incredible numbers, such as up to 75% time saved on common questions and tasks, with a model that is 14.7% more accurate in intent recognition than the leading competition, and a payback period of less than just one year. There's also Conclude AI, which is the only platform of its kind utilizing AI-based compliance regulations to deliver a 50% increase in employee productivity, 29% reduction in compliance misconduct, 84% increase in customer response rate, and a whopping 450% return on closed revenue. Innovating for simplicity requires a focus on both the development team and the business team. By simplifying the process on both ends, we can create a streamlined experience that allows you to go from idea to deployment like never before. Everyone likes to tout the term innovation. I mean, it is a really popular buzzword, but the reality is that you are the innovation superpower. You are the inspiration for the technology that we deliver every single day. And this is just the beginning. This is today's IBM. This is Innovating for Simplicity. Thank you. Wonderful. And now that we've talked a little bit about what it is that we're doing here at IBM to help you innovate and sort of innovating ourselves to help you do so, um, I'd love to go ahead and start answering your questions, you know, whatever, whatever your thoughts, and really hearing your thoughts as well um, on, on what it is that we've shared uh, today. I already see a question coming in from the chat that I'd love to go ahead and answer. Um, kind of open-ended, but I would love to go ahead and, 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 and sort of take a crack at it. Um, this question comes in from Shiva asking, hi, Tanmay Michael, as you know, organizations are now hastening to adopt technologies that will empower them to innovate at unprecedented speed. I would like to know how IBM is playing an important role in providing fast and innovative solutions in this process. Well, I'm glad you asked, Shiva. As we've talked about today, um, I guess those are actually really the two key words there, fast and innovative, right? Um, as I mentioned, for example, you know, going, going back to the example of DB2, Really, our goal is with, you know, all the solutions that we provide to make it so that not only is it the best solution we can provide or really the best solution out there, but at the same time, we want to make it so that it's the easiest to use possible. And traditionally, that's never been the case with enterprise, right? It's either it's super easy to use and it's developer friendly and it works well, or it's enterprise grade and, you know, it fits things like regulatory compliance. It makes it so that we can give you that unique scalability that you require. It's, it's usually been you pick either or, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to deliver the best of both worlds. And that enables you to be able to innovate more quickly. I mean, I, I'm going to take a moment and, you know, Michael knows that I like to rant about this a lot for sure. But I, I'm really, really quickly, though, I do want to take a quick tangent and give you the example of the Swift programming language. Right. Um, and the reason I want to do this is because when, when Apple made Swift, of creating a programming language is, is, is no small feat. Right. That's that's a pretty major investment to make. And when Apple made that investment, they had one clear goal in mind. It was if we're building an entire programming language, we want to make it so that developers can write safe code. Right? We want to make it so that as many errors as possible, we can just make it so that the programming language detects them so it never causes application crashes. Right? That's, that's sort of the key that they were looking for. And similarly, what we're trying to do here at IBM is we're trying to improve your productivity by making it, uh, by, by making it so that our technology is easier to use so that you can focus more of your time on solving your problems instead of you know, figuring out how to use our database or our AI capabilities or whatever else, right? That's been the goal with every single one of our products, whether that's Watson Studio, now with DB2 REST and DB2 Graph and, 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 and other examples, including, for example, the developer content we create, like code patterns. Um, even with 
for example, Hyper Blue, right? What we're doing is this, this internal program is, is helping us make it so that we can use this technology that we build to actually start delivering solutions as well, right? So it, uh, it, it, it really does um, work, work out in, in a lot of different ways in terms of making things fast and, and innovative. Um, Michael, any thoughts? I'm going to jump in. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you, you mentioned that organizations are, are hastening to adopt new technologies to empower them. And you're asking, how is IBM playing an important role uh, on, on providing these solutions? First of all, I think this is a fantastic question. Thank you for asking it. And when you look at if you have if we have a client, right, we're, we're, we're working with one of these businesses we have here today uh, and they need to move quickly. They want to adopt the brand new technologies that's hot on the market that all developers are raving about. They want to build these brand new products that nobody has built before and they want to be the first and they want to be the best. Well, they can't do that if the technology we're providing them doesn't enable them to do that. And so we understand that it starts with us. It has to start with us because you can't go off and do X, Y, Z on our platform if our platform doesn't allow that. And we recognize that innovation is modular. If you can break up your product into tiny little pieces that can all be interchanged, it makes it much easier to implement new solutions to your problems. And so it starts with things like Cloud Pack for Data, which of course mentioned in these slides, right? Cloud Pack for Data is what's allowing us to, to create this, this modular stepping stone for all of your cloud applications, whether you're doing something on-prem, you know, behind a firewall, on the cloud, all through at once, using multiple different cloud services, whatever the case. And it goes even deeper than that. We recognize that the way we are delivering platforms needs to change as well. And that's why we have IBM HyperBlue. Again, this startup culture is, I, I think some people forget just how important the startup culture can really be. When you look at all the major tech companies today, they all started from somewhere. And usually you tend to hear that it started in somebody's garage or it started in the basement, something along those lines. And while we don't really put people in their own garage and say, have fun, <laughs> we, we definitely give them the, the culture of start fresh. You don't have to follow this, this big, you know, slow sort of moving things that, that a lot of other companies like to have, like slow moving when you're a large enterprise. We say, you know, IBM is fast, but we need this to be even faster. So let's give you your own space and do what it is exactly you want to do. And so we allow these people and these teams to create these technologies you know, faster than any large organization ever can. And with their own you know, insights and their own ideas and, and put it all together into a package that we can then deliver to you. So it, it very much is a focus on how do we, as the, as the supplier, right, to, to help you build these innovative products, how do we change the way that we do things? We move fast, but how can we move even faster? We deliver great products, but how can we deliver even better products? It very much starts with the way we design products and what it is we're actually shaping for our users to use. And to me, uh, HyperBlue and Cloud Pack for Data are shining examples of, of that message. And in sort of to extend on that even further, actually, it's like, again, precisely what, what you mentioned, Michael, it's like with, with, with programs like HyperBlue, you have entire sort of mini organizations that have the resources and the access to, you know, these sorts of innovative technologies like, like, like what IBM can provide, but at the same time, the agility and the speed of a small startup, right? And combining those two, you really have a combination that just really, really has the capability to innovate at a speed impossible um, anywhere else, I think. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm really quickly gonna, gonna use one more analogy to another programming language that I really love. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Julia programming language, right? And the entire goal of this programming language is, you know, can we have something that's super easy to use, kind of like Python, but gives you speed like C? sometimes even faster, right? And this programming language, the reason it's so incredible is because it solves a two language problem, right? It makes it so that you no longer need to prototype things in Python and go back and rewrite them in C when you wanna to deploy to production. You can write everything in a single language. You need smaller teams, the code is more debuggable, you're not rewriting things, you know, there's less surface area for bugs. It's just win, win, win all around. And similarly, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it so that you don't need to choose between, you know, being able to develop quickly and move fast or have something that will scale to enterprise levels, right? What we're doing is we're making it so that our platforms are the easiest to work with and at the same time uh, are, are, are sort of able to instantly scale to these these sorts of large um to, to the large requirements that enterprises have um now one more thing i do want to talk about is sort of the the future of tech 
right? Where 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 we think it's where we think it's headed, and and how sort of what what we've talked about fits into that vision. Um, and in particular, you know, there's a couple things that I focused on. You know, I, I started off talking about Watson, then I moved over into the world of DB2, and I feel like that actually is a good analogy for where I think the future is headed. Like if you take a look, you can go a couple years back when the sort of deep learning and machine learning hype sort of first started, right? When we could create convolutional neural networks for the image net image net task, right? Our first focus then was we don't have enough compute power to train these neural nets. And NVIDIA, Google, Apple, IBM, they just, they went on it, right? As uh, they, we, we really focused on that problem. And, you know, we, we've made quite a lot of progress, like comparing an NVIDIA A100 or an IBM Research Analog chip today to, you know, a, a, a Tesla K80 from back then, we've made huge strides in compute power thanks to this potential that deep learning and AI had. Then we focused a lot on compute algorithms, right? How can we build better neural networks that have better architectures? We implemented new normalization techniques, new layers like transformers. But now we're starting to realize that our new bottleneck isn't compute power or algorithms, it's data, right? It's how do you feed these algorithms because we've got all the compute to process it. We've got the algorithms with which to process. Now our bottleneck is data. If you can feed more data and higher quality data, then you'll have a better machine learning algorithm that can help you extract better insight from your data and therefore have better user experience or better you know, experiences in general that you can deliver. Problem is, how do you, in an enterprise environment, make sure that this data follows regulations? How can you make sure um, that it doesn't sacrifice on user privacy delivering these capabilities? You know, there's all sorts of considerations that you need to make that you maybe don't realize from just a raw machine learning engineering perspective, right? And what we're delivering is helping you achieve that third step of data, right? We mentioned Cloud Pack for data. We mentioned Watson Studio. We mentioned DB2. These are solutions to these problems with things like uh, how uh, DB2 enables you to do data virtualization, data federation. These sorts of techniques and capabilities solve all of these problems at once and yet deliver the easiest to use experience with all those capabilities possible, right? So it really is interesting how what, what I think you know, the, the sort of future is looking at, you know, focusing on data and the whole environment around how you collect it, process it, use it in your training and inference. Uh, that's, that's precisely you know, where, where we're headed and, and what, we're, what we're delivering on to help you build out your solutions. So Michael, any, any final thoughts today? Uh, I, I agree with everything you said, definitely, uh, especially talking about uh, data there at the end with uh, how that, that is become our, our, our new bottleneck. And for sure, when you look at what it is we're trying to deliver, it, it almost makes me think back to uh, automation, people who, who look at automation and they think, you know, some people on the outside think, oh, automation is going to take all the jobs and, and things like that. But in reality, automation is allowing us to get rid of these repetitive tasks that you know a computer could do and that gives us more time to focus on the real issues and gives us more time to specialize and do these other tasks that a computer wouldn't be able to just do on its own and when you look at our product lineup it's not that everything we have is an automation tool but that is in you know in the same spirit exactly what we're trying to do we're trying to make things easy these tasks that you, you know, everybody has to go through. We're trying to make them easy. We're trying to make them simple and streamlined so that you can focus more on innovation and you can focus more on these new details. And maybe even we could, we could help support those new details as well. And when it comes to things like data, as Hamay mentioned, how we make sure, are we collecting data the right way? Are we following privacy laws? All these kinds of things. You can focus on these sections and not really have to worry, as Tammy said, do we have the compute power to do it? Do we have the algorithms to do it? Do we have the cloud infrastructure to do it? Uh, you know, can we use the, the right packages? A lot of our developers you know, really like this package, but uh, can we support it? Things like that. And so that is really our, our, our focus is absolutely trying to understand what it is that you need to innovate so that you can go off and innovate. Every company likes to say, oh, we're the innovators, right? We're number one. We innovate left, right, and center. We're not going around saying we're the innovators of the world. We're going around saying, how can we enable you to be the innovators of the world? And, and that is exactly what our focus is. When we look towards the future and we say, here's what the world's going to look like in, uh, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we ask, how can we enable these people to go and do that? Right. We're not focused on let's build robots that can shake hands and, and talk to people. We say, how can we enable you to go do that? 
how can we enable you to go and build that future that that we're all dreaming about with the flying cars and <laughs> whatever it is that you see in 50 years time our focus is how do we let you do that not let's take charge and do that ourselves i see we have 20 seconds left really quick one more question from <laughs> shiva asking how can we help enterprises move into the cloud we do have tools for that, like DB2 click to containerize. IBM Research has AI that can help you transform Java monoliths into microservices and all kinds of things that we don't have time to talk about today. But feel free to let me know about that and I can answer more questions. But thank you everyone for joining us today. All right, thank you very much. Bye everyone.